This is the second lecture on feathers, and in this lecture we're going to focus on the process of replacing the plumage, which is molting, and coloration patterns. So molting is the process in which a bird replaces its feathers, so it's turning over its plumage. And this has to be done on a fairly regular basis because feathers are dead structures and they wear out. So molting is that process. And usually what happens is a feather either just falls out, or if, if a bird is attacked, it may lose some feathers. But old feathers can also just be pushed out from the new feather that's growing in from the epidermis, as shown here. Now we've talked about the total coat of feathers that a bird has as the plumage, and plumages can change with age and season. Particularly in lo long-lived birds, they go through a series of plumages as they age. So we've already talked about natal down. This is the first down that chicks have, and all birds have that. And then they rapidly go into the juvenile plumage, which is the first contour feathers of the juveniles that cover up their feathers. Then some adults, particularly those that are uh, longer lived, go through various sub-adult plumages, where immature individuals have plumages that look different from the uh, mature breeders. This is particularly important in social species and in species where, where females can judge the quality of males by their definitive adult plumage against those immature individuals that really haven't proven themselves yet. And in those species that do show subadult plumages, when they finally get to a breeding age, all of their subsequent plumages are called definitive plumages. And on the very top here, we can see the adult uh, definitive breeding plumage. So that's another thing we need to talk about is there are certain plumages that exist in the non-breeding season and plumages that exist in the breeding season. Here's another example of a situation in which we have delayed maturation and in some species the delayed maturation is seen in males but not females so this is the case of american red starts and painted buntings so here's a picture of a painted bunting we conducted a study of painted buntings for a couple of years looking at their plumage and male quality and territoriality the bird on the right here that i'm holding is an, a male in definitive plumage and this individual is at least two years old the bird on the left is a male that is in its first potential breeding season. And so this male is showing the subadult plumage. And actually in this case it looks almost exactly like a female. There are some subtle differences. You can see a little bit of blue in this one that you wouldn't necessarily see in a female. So I talked about some seasonal patterns of plumages. And the most common molting pattern that we see in birds is that they have two molts per year. And again, the most typical pattern is that only one of these molt is a complete molt, meaning there's only one molt one time of year in which they replace all of their feathers, and in the other molt it's a partial molt, only replacing a part of their feathers. So it is a cycle, so it didn't really matter where we start, but we're going to start here in the breeding plumage, which is also referred to as the alternate plumage. And what I have pictured here is an American goldfinch. We've been seeing American goldfinches in lab, and they certainly don't look like this because they're not in their breeding plumage. But a bird that's in its breeding plumage typically has its brighter plumage. This is the plumage particularly important in males to convince females of their quality. And so they oftentimes are brightly colored. Now, after the breeding season, this bird will go into the pre-basic molt. And this is a complete molt, so it will be replacing all of its feathers. Now, as the name implies, the pre-basic molt will produce the basic plumage. So this is typically the non-breeding plumage. And oftentimes, males and females will look more similarly in the basic plumage, and the males will be much less bright. And so you can see that this bird still has the black wings with the white wing bars, but it is lacking the bright yellow and the black cap. Well, as you can guess from the name of the pre-basic molt going into the basic plumage, what molt would you expect to get you the alternate plumage? Well, that's the pre-alternate molt. And in most birds, there isn't any molt of the flight feathers, so we're not replacing the remiges or the rectrices, the main feathers, the flight feathers of the wing and tail. 
Instead, we're primarily replacing the down semi-plume and contour feathers. So in the case of an American goldfinch, we've already got the black wing and tail feathers. All we're doing is replacing these dull contour feathers here with the bright yellow ones. And again, this provides this breeding plumage, which is called the alternate plumage in this species. That's the typical pattern that we see in most birds. Now there are some deviations from that. In some birds they only have one molt per year, but in some of these they actually still show variation throughout the year as far as their brightness goes. So this is true for American robins and European starlings, and starlings for example, the spots that starlings have when they first produce their feathers actually wear off. They've got these white spots throughout their plumage. But these wear off to produce a shinier, very highly iridescent plumage. And we'll talk about how iridescence is, is produced from a structural point of view later in this lecture. Northern cardinals and purple finches also go through one multi-gear, but they can also change in their brightness. And so here is an example using purple finches. Purple finches, we do have some purple finches uh, here in the wintertime in East Texas, and they look very purpley. Uh, as shown in A here. But these birds, as they progress into the breeding season, there's wear of those feathers that actually reveals a b brighter red plumage underneath that for the breeding plumage. So that was a situation where there's one molt per year, and obviously it has to be a complete molt. Well, in other species, another kind of the opposite end of that variation is two complete molts per year. So this is seen in bobolinks. Bobolinks live in grassland habitats that are actually quite abrasive and they have a lot of wear on all of their feathers, including their flight feathers, and so they need to actually re replace their remiges and erectrices twice a year. One of the more bizarre variations as far as the basic breeding pattern is seen in ducks, in which they go through a very rapid pre-basic molt. In this situation, the birds simultaneously drop all their flight feathers. Now, when I say simultaneously, I don't mean you look out there and suddenly just spoing, they, they pop out. But over a relatively a few number of days, they will drop all of their tail and um, wing feathers. Now, this means that they can't fly during that time period, and so they're restricted to large bodies of water where they try to hang out and, and reduce the chance that they can be attacked by predators. But then they grow these uh, flight feathers back pretty quickly, both during the eclipse uh, plumage phase, and this is what it's called, the eclipse plumage is the result of the rapid pre-basic molt that they have. But this eclipse, eclipse plumage, both sexes are pretty drab, they look very similar, but pretty rapidly then the males go into the pre-alternate molt to get their alternate plumage. And so uh, up here top we've got some wood ducks, female in the back, male in the front, they look fairly similar then you look at them in the, their alternate plumage. Even the female's brighter, but still relatively cryptically colored, but look at the male. Male wood ducks are just simply gorgeous, and so this is their alternate plumage. Same basic thing with mallards, uh, shown here in the lower left. During the uh, male eclipse plumage phase, they look very similar to the females, but their alternate plumage, they look quite different. So, Unlike ducks, most birds don't replace their flight feathers really synchronously. They have to spread that out over a period of time so that they can maintain flight capabilities. And the typical pattern is you may be replacing one or two feathers at a time, and molt typically starts from the middle of the wing, so starting at the first primaries and the first secondaries, and then moving uh, inward for the secondaries, going to the second, Secondary, then the third, as you can see here, is the one that's the, the most recently growing, the newest feather that's just starting to develop in this case. And from the primaries, again, starting in the middle of the wing, moving outward. So the fourth primary in this situation is the youngest that's just growing in. And oftentimes you can see that the outer wing feathers, the outer primaries, and the innermost secondaries have a lot more wear. So it's pretty easy to tell which ones are the new feathers and which ones are the old feathers. Same basic pattern is seen in the rectrices. The first feathers to be replaced uh, are the ones in the very center, so it's as they're numbered. Well, molting is a very energetically and nutritionally a challenging situation for birds, and so they have to time it well with some other major life history events that they may face. 
So for example, you don't want to be molting at the same time you're breeding. Breeding takes a lot of energy. Migration takes a lot of energy. So you don't want to be molting at the same time. And so birds typically time their molts in between these big events. So the pre-alternate molt is occurring before the breeding season. The pre-basic molt occurs after the breeding season and uh, then on either side of migration again, trying to, to fit this in between migration and breeding. The speed of molt varies depending on where the bird lives. So in Arctic and high latitude species, they generally experience longer days, uh, temporary resource abundance so that they can temporarily fuel uh, a more rapid molt and so they don't have to spread it out over a longer period of time. And oftentimes these are migratory species that have a very short breeding season where they've got to concentrate that time and effort into that and then they have to concentrate their molt so that they can get out of there before the weather changes. Tropical species tend to set, have much slower, more continuous molts. And as we'll see also, they tend to not have very definitive reproductive seasons. They tend to stretch out both the breeding season and molt. And there's actually more likely to be considerable overlap between those two uh, life history events. But feathers take a lot of time and energy and nutrient to produce. And so you need to take care of them. And so if you watch birds, they spend much of their daily time budget preening. I used to, in this class, require students to do a behavioral study of birds where they would have to go out and do a time budget and watch a species of bird for, say, 10 hours and record wh what percentage of their time during a daily basis do they do. And one of the things that I got constantly from students was, oh my gosh, this is so boring, that bird's just sitting there preening. It's just preening. This is all it does is it just sits there and preens. But it's an important part of the bird's life. They, the preening process is where they're keeping their feathers in place, you know, zipping those veins back together as we talked about, making sure those distal barbules are overlapping with the uh, proximal barbules on the next barb. Keep that nice flight surface capable when you need to, to do it. But also removing parasites. Um, these are very damaging to feathers, and so you want to make sure that you're parasite-free, and we'll talk about that in more detail in a little bit. But the preening process typically is associated with bills. Birds are using their bills and running the feathers through their bills in the preening process. But sometimes they can also use their feet. So we talked about how some birds have pectinate claws, so comb-like structures uh, on their feet. And that's seen in herons and night jars and uh, barn owls. Another important structure associated with preening is the uropygial gland, which is also called the preen gland. The oils help to clean and maintain flexibility and, and keep the feathers from drying out and becoming brittle. There's some indication that they may provide some waterproofing too. Their data um, are, are a little mixed on that. I've read some reports that say that the uropygial gland doesn't really uh, help much with waterproofing. But if you look at birds that spend a lot of time in water, they sure do have very large uropygial glands. And some of the chemicals that are found in these oils also can affect the bacterial communities and fun fungal communities and help to prevent parasite infections. Um, some of the bacteria that can degrade feathers, uropygial gland oils can dissuade those bacteria from growing, but at the same time, studies have indicated that there are chemicals that will actually increase the likelihood of other bacteria growing on the feathers that are also kind of counter to the growth of those other bacteria. So it's kind of like getting the good bacteria to help you fight the bad bacteria. And remember, the uropygial gland is located right at the uh, base of the tail feathers, sitting on top of the pygostyle. So I talked about the negative consequences of parasites. So birds can have parasites like uh, ticks that can suck their blood. You know, mosquitoes can cause certain illnesses like malaria. Um, so, but that's not really the type of parasite I'm talking about here. Birds have a very specific type of feather parasite called malophagans. Malophagans are specialists on eating feathers. And here you can see one electron micrograph of one up close. They're jaws and their legs are highly modified for specific sizes of attachment to feathers. So they, they fit the arachis perfectly. And so oftentimes they're very species specific, but they do uh, eat 
the beta keratin associated with the feathers and so they can damage these and this has a couple of negative some serious negative consequences for birds including removing the plumulaceous regions in a bird that help it to maintain its temperature and so it can actually uh, reduce the, the chance that a bird will survive a, a harsh winter and you can see these contour feathers down here on the left and you can see one that has not had any parasites and then two that come from birds that have different levels of parasitic infections. A second negative consequence of having these is they actually degrade the coloration and the general contour of a, of a bird's feathers. And this is particularly problematic in males that are trying to convince females of their high quality. And so if a female looks at a male and says, wow, your feathers are not very bright and they don't, the contour feathers don't kind of overlap, well, that's not a sign that you're very good quality. You have a lot of parasites. I don't want to you know, mate with an individual that's infected with parasites. Well, Dale Clayton at the University of Utah uh, conducted a study to see what were females actually seeing this damage of the feathers and using the feathers as an indication or were they actually looking at, could they actually just see parasites and, and didn't want to mate with males because they saw parasites? Well, he was able to use a bill modification to the birds to allow some birds to get higher parasite loads than others to kind of reduce their preening efficiency. But then he treated uh, certain of them with pesticides so that they had the damage from the Molophagans, but they didn't have Molophagans themselves. And then in another group, they had uh, both the damage and they still had an, an active infection of Molophagans. And then they did some trials to see if females could tell the difference and, and they couldn't. So females just generally don't like males that have these damaged feathers. So preening is a good way of getting rid of these parasites by just you know using your bill to, to pick them out. But bathing uh, also helps to dislodge these parasites and get rid of excess oils, old oils. And this obviously includes using water, but then also some birds that live in very dry environments that don't have access regularly to water will do what's called dust bathing, as seen here with this scaled or blue quail. Another behavior that is, tends to be associated with preening that we see in birds is called sunning, where birds will go to really hot areas, spread their wings, oftentimes they'll kind of rotate their head toward the sun, closing their eyes, and then they'll start panting. So you, it's clear that they're heat stressed when they're doing this. So this is kind of a, a curious behavior. Why would they do something that is clearly causing them some physiological stress? Well, there are a couple of potential reasons for sunning. One is it may heat up those feathers and make the oils more uh, easy to spread throughout the, the uh, feathers to be more effective. But the other thing that you tend to see is really rapid, very active, aggressive preening once a bird finishes sunning. And that may be because the parasites are kind of on the move from the sunning and you're more likely to be able to get access to them and remove them. A final behavior that's associated with preening that's kind of bizarre is what's called anting behavior, where a bird will actually land in an ant pile and encourage ants to crawl all over it as seen here in this crow. So what could be going on here is the ants are actively going after the parasites and helping to remove them. Sometimes the birds will actually try to incite the ants to sting their feathers and maybe just the release of the formic acid itself, uh, which then can be smoothed through the feathers through preening, uh, or in some cases grabbing the ants and actually wiping them through the feathers uh, is also a way of, of getting that formic acid widely spread to reduce parasitic infections. Oftentimes kind of lumped with anting is a behavior in which birds will get citric uh, fruits like lemons and limes and also rub those through their feathers and it may be serving the same kind of function of, of getting that citric acid uh, into the feathers. All right, as I've mentioned, oftentimes the plumage of birds, especially in the breeding season, is brightly colored. So let's talk about the importance of feather color and how feather color comes about in feathers. First, let's talk about you know, what are the, the visual capabilities of birds? We talked about this a, a little bit previously. But if we look at the electromagnetic spectrum in general, visible light occupies just a very small part of that. And uh, then we have these really long waves off here to the left and really short waves 
uh, on the right. But the longer waves associated with visible light are in the red and infrared, and then the shorter waves are associated with uh, the violet colors, blue colors, and uh, ultraviolet light, as we can see in birds. So th those are the colors that we can see, what we call the visual spectrum. But as we're going to see, the birds can see some infrared in some cases and are very good as far as uh, seeing into the ultraviolet. But when we describe the characteristics of color, sometimes you see different terms that are used. So like hue or chroma. Well, that's just talking about the basic color. So are you talking about something that's blue or green or red? Um, and it's usually defined as what is the most intense wavelength? So which, which wavelength dominates uh, when you're measuring a feather? So uh, looking down here in this uh, picture on the uh, left, all of this area in, in this general region right here, we would def def define that hue as green. Now, if, if the feather was made up of lots of wavelengths of light in the general green hue, it would not be a very saturated color. But if we talked about one that just had that specific wavelength right there, that specific green, we would say that's a highly saturated color. But within any single hue or any specific saturation, the brightness of that feather would be its intensity. So this is a very intense green right here. But if we move off over here, the same region, that's the same saturation and same hue, but it's not very bright. So the intensity would be very low. So how do we measure that? So there are uh, machines that we actually have some in the biology department here that we've used in some of our studies uh, called spectrophotometers. Uh, and this is uh, some, a, a photo that uh, Matt, Dr. Kwiatkowski took when we were doing this study. So these are different males. So I've already talked about in painted buntings how this is a juvenile male in its first uh, breeding season. Looks more like a female. These are three different males that look, you know, not too different to the human eye. But if you look at them under the spectrophotometer, you see that the green that is shown here, so here we can see the visible light spectrum associated with different wavelengths of light. You can see that, that this individual right here, look at how much taller this peak is. So that's a brighter green associated with, so I mean a higher intensity, right? Well, so they're all the same basic hue but also look at the saturation of this individual. It, the, the degrees of green that it has, it's much sharper peaked compared to the flatter hues of green seen here. So the hues are all the same, but this has much greater saturation associated with this specific green. And what we found is that some of these coloration patterns were uh, apparently important to females as far as mate choice. Uh, particularly one of the traits was this uh, intensity uh, and saturation of the greens that we see on the backs on this region called the mantle. The other thing that we noticed, and an important thing to realize, is when you're studying color, remember birds can see UV. They can see colors that we can't see. So if we're going to study those, we can't do it with just the, the human visual eye. You have to use something like a spectrophotometer. And that's what we're showing here is not only did that individual have greater intensity and saturation associated with this green, it also had greater indicators of quality as far as uh, saturation and intensity for hues that we would describe as ultraviolet. So see, this is the visual spectrum for humans up here. We can't see these colors right here that clearly are showing up in this uh, region of feathers in this bird. So as I mentioned, those are the colors that we can see from red to violet. Bird, birds can see uh, additional colors uh, into the infrared as we're starting to understand, at least in some cases. But we know that they've really got uh, excellent vision in ultraviolet. So what gives a feather a different color? Let's talk a little bit about that. So we're going to break this up into two basic categories. We're going to talk about pigment-based colors and structural colors. Let's talk first about pigments. Pigments are chemicals that are actually embedded within a feather that absorb certain wavelengths of light and reflect or emit other wavelengths of light. So here we've got the keratin associated with the, the top of a feather and underneath that embedded within the feather are pigment granules. 
and we'll talk about different pigment granules. But we have the sun shining all wavelengths of light. Some of those clearly are being absorbed into this feather, but this pigment happens to remit just red wavelengths of light. And so we see this as a red bird. And it really doesn't matter where the sun is or the angle bouncing off of this, you're always going to get red and, and basically the same intensity of red. So let's talk about the types of pigments that birds have. The most common is a class of pigments called melanins. They're found in almost all bird feathers. Most bird feathers have some melanins in them. So when they're the predominant pigments, they also give birds kind of grays, blacks, browns, buffy, reddish brown, and sometimes light yellow colorations like you would see in the down of a uh, baby chick, of a chicken. Melons are actually synthesized by birds and stored in melanosomes. Not only are they important in the coloration, but they also provide some important strength in, in helping to resist wear in feathers. And so you tend to see them in areas that need that kind of strength like wingtips, wingtips that uh, get a lot of abrasion and from just flight or abrasive habitats that a bird might live in, those tend to have a, a high concentration of dark melanins. They also help to a bird warm up and dry in certain situations, dry their feathers. And research has indicated that uh, darker feathers sometimes help to resist soil bacterial damage. So darker birds uh, tend to be found in more mesic conditions, and this, this apparently helps them to, again, encourage good bacterial community growth on their feathers, but resist some of the bad bacteria. And that may explain why you see lighter colored birds in uh, drier habitats and in wetter, uh, more mesic situations, you get darker colored birds. The second most common type of pigments are called carotenoids. These tend to be really bright yellows, oranges, and reds. Now the birds can't make these. These are produced by plants, algae, and fungi. And so the bird has to actually sequester them from their diet. So they have to eat seeds, for example, plant material that has carotenoids, and then they take this chemical out of the seeds um, and use it in their feather production. Again, these are pretty common. They're found in lots of birds, and they oftentimes are very important in indicating individual quality, particularly in female choice of males of different quality. So the red of this northern cardinal over here, this is carotenoid based. Now the melanin is, is associated with the black bib and face markings here. And oftentimes the contrast between these is important in mate choice. Same thing with this prothonotary warbler. We hopefully will be able to see these if we go out to the tram road um, in swampy like or riparian habitats. In the southeast, you can see these prothonotary warblers, and the males have this amazing yellow coloration. Now, there are other ways of producing red, oranges, and yellows. In parrots, they actually produce lipids that have these color characteristics. These are called cetacofluvins. Remember, uh, the cetaciforms are, is the order that contains, or the clade that contains, parrots. And so this is a synapomorphy for that group of birds. And you can actually tell that in some cases these, these do have different levels of intensity uh, relative to the red, oranges, and yellows that they produce. A final class of pigments, uh, there are more than these, but I'm just kind of hitting some of the big ones, are porphyrins. Porphyrins produce bright browns, kind of more bronzy colors. Some greens, some reds, uh, some magentas. This is a very rare uh, class of chemicals. Um, it's seen in some owls, but it's primarily known in the musophagiforms or the turicos. These are actually produced by the birds themselves. They're chemically very similar in structure to hemoglobins and probably a past uh, gene duplication event from a hemoglobin gene is, is what produced the genes that uh, allow the production of porphyrins. One of the ways that you can identify when porphyrins are in a feather is shine UV light on the feather and it lights up glowing red. And that's uh, one of the characteristics of porphyrins. Now, unfortunately, porphyrins, when they do give you these bright colorations, as seen in this turico here, once they are made into a museum specimen, you have to be very careful at, at preventing exposure to light because they do degrade and will fade uh, quickly in museum specimens if they're not uh, put into dark protected areas. 
So we talked about the different pigment classes and how they give you different colors, but you can get colors in feathers that are combinations of pigments. So for example, an olive flycatcher will have this olive coloration, which is a combination of melons and carotenoids. Okay, let's switch gears now and talk about structural color. So structural color also uses pigments, but it's not the chemical constituents of the pigments themselves that cause the differential refraction of light. Instead, it's the structure associated with how those pigments, usually melanin granules and, and air bubbles, uh, are kind of laid out. So what this causes is refraction of light as it passes through the feather microstructure. And so what that means is there are different wavelengths of light that bend at different angles. So select wavelengths are then absorbed and other wavelengths reflected back. So let's look at the different types of reflectance associated with structural color. First, we can have incoherent reflectance. And this is when all of the wavelengths are reflected back, and so the overall appearance is white. But let's contrast that with coherent reflectance. And coherent reflectance only select wavelengths reflected back. The consistency of the color and the specific color that is reflected is due to the specific organization of layers of melanin, keratin granules, and air bubbles. And there are two basic forms of coherent reflectance. You can get structural blues and iridescence. So structural blues would be like in the bird in the left, and iridescence is clearly seen with the multicolored bird on the right. So what's really the difference though? In structural blue, you're getting a consistent color sent back to you, a consistent hue. As a matter of fact, the saturation doesn't even change with different angles of the light. So you're getting the same color. Now the one thing that we will see that can change is the intensity of light. That can change depending on the angle of the sun. So that's what we see here in A. When the sun strikes these layers, goes through the uh, keratin, then it goes through the uh, spongy layer, which is a matrix of keratin and air molecules. And this is, in this case, going to absorb all of the other wavelengths of light, but reflect back blue. And it doesn't depend on the angle of the sun. You're still going to get that same hue. In the figure on the right, what we see is with the sun hitting at a specific angle, depending on the viewer's angle to the sun, you're going to get different colors because you're talking about different angles of reflectance going through the multiple layers of melanin nodules and keratin layers. And in this general uh, type of iridescence, generally the more layers, the more brilliant the color that is reflected back. So at, at one angle, you would get this really nice purple, but at a slightly different angle, you're going to change the hue that you get. So with iridescence, you get different colors with different angles. But with structural blues, in some cases structural reds, you don't change the hue. And, and in fact, you don't even change the saturation. What you can change is the intensity. So let's kind of demonstrate that with a ruby-throated hummingbird, which has a nice ruby red throat. If you look at it at just the right angle, it will just strike you as this brilliant red, almost LED-like light striking you. And that's because if you're looking at it straight on, you get multiple wavelengths of light striking your eye and they merge together with their complete alignment to give you a nice constructive pattern. If, however, you look at them at a different angle, some of these wavelengths of light are reaching your eye sooner than others. And so they're not completely lined up. And so you're getting the same hue. In fact, you're getting the, the same saturation, but the amplitude of these total the total signal you're getting is reduced. So the intensity is going to be reduced. And so it's going to come off as a duller red. And if you look at it from the side where you see these light uh, patterns coming off the bird in a complete disassociation with each other as far as their peaks and valleys, that's going to cancel out and you're just going to get kind of a straight line which will appear to your eye as black. But it's just the, the complete reduction in the intensity. So here's another example of a bird that's showing you structural blue. So you see that this, the color really hasn't changed uh, across here. The intensity is changing depending on the angle a little bit of, and how these feather, contour feathers are sitting. But this is a massively uh, iridescent bird over here. And if it could turn, 
you would see that these this purple could turn to blue and this could turn to green and so forth. You would just get this uh, rainbow of colors as the bird changes. So we've talked about pigments and structural colors and, and the colors that they can produce. We talked about combination of pigments that can give you different colors, but you can also have combinations of pigments and structural colors. In fact, most greens that we see in birds are due to structural blue and yellow carotenoids. So this green J here is actually yellow pigments linked with blue structural colors. We see the same interaction between structural blues and yellow carotenoids here in this budget regard. Um, actually, you know, it says uh, yellow carotenoids here, and I believe that's what your book says, but remember you can also get yellows uh, with cetacofluvins, and that may be what's going on here since this is a parrot. We see the greenish color right here is associated with a yellow pigment and coherent blue. The combination of that is going to give you this nice consistent green. Now this is a species that has been put into captivity and they have undergone artificial selection to emphasize certain traits when mutations arise. And so you can buy varieties of these that are all blue where the wild form is green. Well these are mutations that fail to produce the yellow pigments. So they don't use the yellow cetacefluvins that we talked about previously. And so they're just going to appear blue. Well, here's the reverse of that. Here's a mutant that has the yellow pigments, but it's lacking the structural blue. Instead, it's sending back incoherent white that just gives it this nice kind of lemony color. And then if you lack both the structural blue and you're just producing incoherent white, you're just going to get a white bird. Well, what about UV? UV colorations are oftentimes associated with feathers that we see as blue and violet colored. And it turns out, I mean, they can also be seen in, in other uh, regions as well, including some of the soft tissue parts, like in some of the scales of the leg. UV color is seen in almost all families of birds that have been examined. And in fact, sometimes if we look at species that we think are monomorphic from a color perspective, it turns out that they do have different UV signatures, and so to other birds, it would be easy to tell the difference between males and females. And we're also finding out that some species that we thought were one species actually have pretty consistent plumage differences that allow for different species recognition from an avian sense, and they don't breed with each other. And so we would consider these what are called cryptic species species that do exist but we didn't identify them initially because to us they looked the same. There are some other characteristics of feathers that give them uh, different appearances. So shiny feathers are typically associated with large flat surfaces. Uh, so we have larger barbs, uh, larger rachis, and, and really flat uh, veins. So it depends on how those barbs are put together. But the flatter the surface, the shinier it's going to be. On the other hand, a velvety soft feather is going to give off this kind of plush-like uh, buffy appearance. And this is associated with long barbules that are actually sticking up through the vein surface. We talked about how that also uh, reduces the sound in something like an owl. So why are feathers colored? What, are, what is the function of these? How can these be adaptive in different situations? Well, in some regards, plumage patterns are adaptive for the perspective of camouflage. So that's very clear in something like a night jar that can be uh, sitting on a nest on the ground and so it blends in with the soil or the leaf litter. Um, a resting frog mouth is seen here, looks like the broken off stub uh, of a branch. This bird right here in this photo is not very camouflaged. But this is a ptarmigan that would be living in uh, snowy conditions and so in most respects it would be very well camouflaged. And we generally don't think about bright green parrots as being camouflaged because you usually see them in a cage. But I guarantee you, you go to the tropics and you start looking for parrots, they can be very difficult to find. You hear them all the time, but finding them in a tree can be difficult if they're not moving because they're just, they blend in so well with the green canopy. Another way that you can try to blend in with the background is demonstrated by this bird right here. So notice that we've got the edges that are broken up. So we've got white and then we have a, a breaking pattern here with black and then another white and then brown. And you have this kind of br broken outline. That's what's called disruptive coloration. That breaking up of the background kind of helps you blend in better. The other thing this bird is demonstrating is what's called countershading. So countershading is where you're 
a brown or a darker coloration on the dorsal aspect, but the ventral surface is white or buffy. What this tends to do is uh, allow the ventral surface to reflect back some of the coloration of the ground and again just help them blend in more. Well in some cases birds want to do the opposite. They want to advertise where they are. One way to do that is to be a solid color because in general that's going to make you stand out from a more varied background. So this summer tanager is demonstrating that. The other thing you can do is have contrasting edges uh, associated with plumage patches. So here we have a hooded merganser and you notice it's got this nice white patch. Well what helps to make that white patch stand out more is it's completely bordered by black. Same thing kind of here associated with the, these wing patches in this gull and the white patches here in the uh, cuckoo. But the other thing that these two demonstrate is ge regular geometric patterns. Regular geometric patterns again are relatively rare in the background of nature and so they tend to stand out more when they're represented in plumage. So why would you want to advertise where you are? Well, one is to identify yourself to species, so to other individuals of your species. This could be particularly important associated with mating and mate attraction. And then once that basic identification is made, then there is the indication of recognizing males versus females. And from the female perspective, we're going to talk about the importance of male quality being linked to the quality of their plumage coloration in many cases. Females can use this as a sign of the quality of various potential mates and they only want to mate with the highest quality males. Lastly, something that was discovered about 20 years ago is that some birds show aposematic coloration. So this is a pitahui and there are various species of pitahuis in New Guinea and this species was discovered by Jack Dumbacher and some colleagues when he was in graduate school. What they found is that these birds have really high concentration of neurotoxins in their feathers and in parts of their epidermis. What's amazing is this is the exact same toxin or, or very similar toxin, same family of toxins found in the poison arrow frogs of South America. But again, this is a bird in New Guinea. What it turns out is both the frogs and the pitahuis are eating insects that can sequester these toxins. And so they're basically eating the insects and then sequestering these toxins themselves and putting them into their epidermal tissue. So I mentioned that this demonstrates aposomatic plumage. Aposomatic plumage is plumage, again, that's advertising. In this case, it's advertising, hey, you don't want to eat me. You don't want to mess with me because I'm toxic. I'm not a rewarding prey item. Aposomatic plumage is typically associated with contrasting carotenoids, uh, colors, reds, yellows, oranges, uh, with black outline. And that's exactly what the pitahuis show here. And just like what we see in some insects that are showing aposomatic coloration, some of them are toxic and they're truly indicating that uh, with their aposomatic appearance. But there can be mimicry, mimicry of individuals that are actually quite tasty, but they're trying to convince a potential prey that they are toxic. And the same thing is seen with some pitahuis. All right, that's our last lecture about feathers themselves. Now we're going to talk about the other main function of feathers, which is flight in the next lecture.